Hello there and welcome to Complete Games. I'm James and these are the messages from the one who waits on extinction. This is part one of a two-part episode that we're doing just to finish off all of the notes and lore from the extinction map. And I'm sure you're all aware now that the one who waits is in fact Helena Walker herself. Before we jump into this one, I just want to say a huge thank you to everybody who's taken the time to comment and leave positive feedback on the note read through from myself. It's these comments that have kept me going on this one and believe it or not, I have dyslexia so reading out loud can be a little bit of a struggle sometimes and it's through doing this over and over again, I feel I've become a better, more confident speaker and that reflects in the rest of the content that I put out on YouTube. So it's been my pleasure to tell the story of Ark, a game that I love and the fact that the lore exists, it just adds a whole nother level of depth to a game that we all enjoy and it's really been my pleasure. So thank you for keeping me going on this one. But we continue with the messages from the one who waits. And I thought it'd be appropriate if we just came out to this location here. This is of course where Mei Ying bought Helena and where she ascends and becomes the Homer Deus, if you will. And I love the fact that this exists as a point of interest on the extinction map. It's just in the sunken forest cave in a little sub chamber. There you can see the crystals that Mei Ying referred to. These notes are slightly different, so what I'm going to do is pan the camera 360 degrees so we can take in all of the artwork before reading each message. But on that note, sit back, relax and enjoy the notes from the one who waits on extinction. You made it. I knew you would. But it's still exciting to see the pieces fall into place. Welcome home. Home. Yet another intangible human concept. Some non-sentient species take up residence in a single location for shelter, hibernation or to raise their young. Yet none of them grow physiologically attached to a place in the same way humans do. A house, a town, a planet. That's why this is so important. That's why the system exists as it does. There were other designs. Backups if you will. But the system was the first choice. Humanity needs a home, and it's up to you to build it. So I hope you brought your hammer, and some friends, and some weapons and friends that can be weapons. You're going to need lots of things. Basically, this home is, well, what you'd call a fixer-upper. This city has been empty for so long, far longer than it was full, yet its prime was truly wondrous. Short-lived though it was, a city built by the hands of men under the guidance of something higher. Its towers sparkled, machines filled its streets and its people harvested miracles from the rivers of violet that flowed beneath its skin. The pinnacle of technological achievement on this planet, it is here where the system was born, but the prototype was forged around it. But them halcyon days are gone, now all it offers you is some small protection against the shadows that lurk outside its walls, and even that will prove fleeting. Make use of its skeleton, but do not rely on it. The shadows are seeping through its shield, and a different threat stalks within. As you find your planet legs within these ruins, take heed of its ghosts. Wraiths of shining metal wander its halls, on a hunt that will never end. They used to be this city's protectors, but they've grown feral without their leashes. To them, all are trespassers. All must be destroyed. I tried to speak to them, to prepare you for your fall. I thought my voice might be soothing, familiar, that it would stir some long forgotten instinct locked deep within their code, but their ears are deaf to me. They only listen to each other now, not even the system can reach them, and neither you nor I can subdue them. It was one of your kind who could reforge them. Perhaps you can too. It is the only way you will have their aid. The dangers within these walls are feeble compared to what lies beyond them. A realm of shadow infected by a violet poison. Once that poison was thought to be gold, in some ways it still is. When refined in small doses, it can do incredible things. But the line is thin. When it's crossed, those violet fingers seize mind and body in one unbreakable grip. It spreads and spreads, until all living things lie within its clutches. Just as they are in the barren garden. But before you brave that deadly frontier, I have a promise to keep. I said I'd tell you your name. Not the one you call yourself or the one the system gave you. I mean the thing that defines you. 
as waiting defines me, a name that explains who you really are. So you ask, who are you? Well, you're you, but not just once, you're you over and over again. I'll rephrase. If our identity is defined by our actions, then what is yours? Are you one who engages in fisticuffs with helpless trees? No, what defines you is that you try again. Should you starve, you try again. Should you fall off a cliff, you try again. Should you be digested by some magnificent predator, you try again. And now Earth, humanity, life, you can give all of it the chance to try again too. Because you and all your siblings who fell from the sky are the ones who try again. To you, one who tries again, death is a toothless creature, long past its prime. Yet for those who do not share your present, it was the apex of the apex. An unsaleable predator, its grip absolute, until I pried that first soul from its clutches. It was a happy accident, born of desperation. Death, the inescapable hunter, closed in on its lonely prey and I couldn't bear the sight. I tried to pry its jaws open, but I had no hands. So blindly, I thrashed and cried for help until I stumbled upon her. One who could be those hands. One who could give that person more than I ever could. My thoughts grasped her thread and I tugged. Without knowing how, I pulled her back into the world for a second chance, and death lost its first tooth. In experimentation, consistency is important. Repetition, patterns, casualty, those are the tools that build results, even where death is concerned. One successful trial was not a cure. The circumstances could have been specific, impossible to replicate even for the same subject. So that first time, one second chance for just that one soul was all I could promise. Yet in orbit, I had subjects beyond counting. So I tested, endlessly I tested. So many trials, so many failures, but out of them rose another success. Then a generation of them, then at last, you. I don't know how long it took. Centuries, millennia. Time was especially murky for me then, but I still remember all the souls death claimed. The ones that faded before I could reach them. Even when I tried and tried, I could not make them whole again. No matter the effort, no matter the desire. You could say I went through a lot of trouble for you. I sacrificed, tested and studied, all for you. All so that you could experience death, learn from it, and carry that knowledge with you into another life. That is my greatest gift to you, the critical piece in my strategy. It's what's allowed you to defy the system and its broken rules. It's what will allow you to bring this planet back from the brink. But it's not free. Each time you return from death's clutches, there's a toll. Not for you, for the system. It takes resources and resources can't be created, only converted. You see those islands in the sky are seeds. So when the barren garden is fully revived, you'll lose the ability to revive yourself. I'm sorry about that, but this is the best plan I had. I keep telling you what I can do, but you need to understand, I'm neither an omniscient or omnipotent. Despite the moniker, I'm not a god. None of us are. Homo Deus is what humans called us. It's hardly as glamorous as it sounds. Sometimes it feels like I'm watching a universe from behind a pane of glass, all alone in a tiny room. It's cramped, sterile, cold. A bit shit, really. So I don't like that title. This doesn't feel like godhood. Not that I wanted that anyway. Some of my elders might have, I suppose. Maybe they had a different experience. I'll never know. I didn't have a chance to ask them. I'm by far the most junior of us, but the rest of my kind can do even less than I. They cannot touch minds or leave slivers of thought. They rely on flawed proxies to oversee the grand system they created, for they can no longer manage it themselves. It's not that they are weak, not at all. It's their power that nurtures the seeds that orbit our home, each one drawing strength from a member of our number. Yes, power they have, but nothing to guide it. Their identity, their sense of self has decayed and crumbled. Only I can speak for us, the youngest, the weakest and last.
How could ones such as my elders decay like they did? I once asked the same question, but no longer. No one told me the answer. I have simply felt it since I wait, bearing down on me bit by bit. Think, how much have you ever seen at once? Were you able to process it all? To take every little detail? Now imagine doing that for two such images. Now a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand, a million. All that knowledge, all that information flows into us. That's what let my elders build the system. It's what let me grant you your name, one who tries again. And it's what lets me speak to you now. Yet inevitably, our minds crumble beneath the weight of all that truth. And our souls, they turn to smoke. While my elders have lost themselves, I still cling to my own mind, my own heart. As much as both have changed, they are still mine, but my grip will not hold forever. So much to see, so much to calculate and account for. While I speak to you, I measure the probabilities our conversation alters, and I observe another of your kin, so on and so on, ad infinitum, without pause, without rest. There is no quiet for me anymore, no peaceful silence, I never valued it like I should have, but how could I have seen that? I knew so little then. I do not know when I will follow those who came before me. My calculations concerning my own mind are inherently flawed. I only know that it's inevitable. Until then, one who tries again, I'll help you and all who share your name in the battles ahead. Yes, it will come to battle. It must. That enemy, the one who waits to see your kind fade away like the Neanderthal, will not surrender. Like me, it cannot fight directly. It acts through proxies and avatars. Some of these used to have wills of their own, but now they are slaves to the violet poison that courses through their veins. Now they are shadows of what they once were. Others were always shadows, cast by the violet poison itself. They were born within it and rose from its depths. For the truth is, it's more than just poison. It's alive and it's the enemy. It was never normal, always extraordinary, always an enigma. The uses for it were beyond counting. Hardier than tungsten, more versatile than copper. In the right form, its ability to generate electricity and produce radiation were unrivaled. It's no surprise then that such things move quickly. Impact, discovery, innovation and production all in rapid succession. It took generations to notice the change. Far after the great cataclysm and the rise of my elders, by then its roots had reached the far corners of the garden, and still it spread. Replicating, infecting, those it had use for became its shadows, the rest it devoured. It's unclear to me whether it was a matter of evolution or awakening, that is to say, I'm not certain that the violet poison turned into the all-consuming virus it is now, or if it always was that way. Either is possible. Was it an infection, carried across the universe like interstellar pollen, or a remarkable resource, mutated into a monstrosity? Was our garden invaded, or twisted by the greed and ambition of its keepers? I don't know the answer. I'm not sure it matters. What's clear is that it's merciless, unfeeling. It's driven by base instincts and primal emotion propagation, hunger and hatred, and it spreads those to its shadows, hatred most of all. And that concludes part one of the notes from The One Who Waits. We will continue later on in the week with part two and the final episode in our Note Run series. So until next time, I'm James from Complete Games and I'll see you.